I'm breaking down something that I came up with. So, you know, have that as you will. But I call this TL junction flexion syndrome. I think it's extremely common in my age range in particular. Um, and I think that's kind of carried through the past uh, few earlier generations. Um, and we'll kind of explain why. So what is it first of all though? Well, TL junction is the junction between your lumbar and thoracic spine. So that's basically T11, T12, L1, L2, more or less. Uh, this is a transitional area. So this is an area where it's uh, estimated we get about 60% of our thoracic spine rotation and a lot of the extension because that's really about the peak if you think L2, L1 of the lumbar lower dosis of the human spine. So TL junction flexion syndrome is where we are kind of stuck in flexion or we reverse that lower dosis and don't worry for all my functional chiropractors out there. I'm not going to shoot an x-ray if somebody tell them they are going to have flexion or straightening of the spine, then I'm going to restore that curvature and then do another x-ray. We're going to restore function though. Um, and then there's offsets to having increased flexion or decreased extension, however you want to look at it, in the TL junction uh, area, which we're going to go over. So why does this occur and why is it common in particular with my generation? Why is it something that I deal with? Well, if you uh, have ever seen a kid sitting in a, you know, nowadays a bumbo chair or a jumper, uh, a walker, uh, a swing in the doorway, in particular before they're of the age where they can sit up on their own, which is typically about 10 months old, um, they don't have adequate uh, intra-abdominal pressure uh, against gravity, uprighting, uh, lower abdominal wall activity to actually maintain a neutral spine or lumbar lower dosis in a seated position, and then the seat puts them in that position, but what do we see? they fall into TL junction flexion. Well, then the offset to stay upright is what? Well, it's an kind of overextension or overcompensation in the T4 to T8 area in your uh, thoracic spine, which you've probably already established pretty decent extension by that time in your life when you're able to start sitting up, even though you have to have some support of a chair or a walker, because when we start interacting with the ground on tummy time, where are we uprighting from? This kind of upper mid thoracic spine. So we're just using the area that functions well to override the area that doesn't function great yet and we're being forced into a position by our lovely parents. So thanks mom. Um, so what do we see later in life with these things? Well, they're the person or the kid that uh, if we have them sit with their legs straight out, maybe really hard to get tall through TL junction, we're gonna see that uh, military spine or ramrod spine or scalloping of the mid T spine in between the shoulder blades T4, T8 to offset for that. And this has a lot of ramifications. Uh, scapular dynamic instability, uh, you know, we may start hammering lower lumbar spine into extension because we lack TL junction, which again is that lower dosis. And let's talk about that lower dosis for a second. That is the thing, one of the things, but one of the most important things that allowed humans to become a primate that became bipedal, right? That lumbar lower dosis allowed us to basically become upright and get our pelvis into an orientation, which then allowed the pelvis to continue to evolve to allow us to have good bipedal movement and in particular running. So if we see somebody that's losing the ability to get extension through TL junction, which is absolutely crucial, we could see how that functionally would affect things like walking, running, and maybe lead to or be a culprit in pain as far as function is concerned. Um, so with that, what do we do with that? Well, uh, you can go check out a reel on my Instagram. I'm going to go through a couple exercises that we would kind of, uh, you know, throw at somebody to work on this. And the first thing would be, can we actually move in that area, right? So you have to establish mobility first, and that could be partially due to a stability problem, right? So it's not like we're just going to go in there and passively get motion and then expect them to take over. Um, this is also usually something that's been persistent, like I said, from developmental years, very early on in life. So this is something that we work on. You can make change, but it's probably something you're gonna be chipping away, uh, you know, in particular, if you get an adult in your office that's dealing with this. The other common thing that I see with this is, uh, you know, a lot of people ask me the question, which is, you know, it's a question, maybe not an awesome one. What's the best posture? Well, that's, that's a really tough question to answer. Best posture is the next one, is the, the hip thing to say, right? Because I mean, you're moving. But what I would say is a lot of people, they're going to overcorrect their posture that have this issue again, that if I sit, you know, 
legs out straight like this and I'm this person, that it's really hard for me to get into that lower dotted curve from this position. You'd be like, oh, that's, you know, that's posterior chain tightness. Well, how do we test that on people? Well, we test their posterior chain and then you can start ruling out where is the actual dysfunction occurring. What are we going to see the postural correction? It's extreme upriding through the T-spine or mid-T-spine rather than TL junction. So we'll sit somebody down and say, hey, get tall. What do we see? They knock in a pelvic anterior tilt and ramrod here. <laughs> and again, this is a broad strokes uh, you know, approach to defining pain on this type of person. But what are we going to see? Probably lower lumbar extension base pain. And that person that's like, man, I'm always really tight between my shoulder blades because they're hanging on to this high threshold strategy. In another video, I'll be talking about scapular stability and how that's tied into this posture as well. But this is just something that I'm, uh, I've been thinking about for a long time. I would love to collect data on this in the office. Yeah, it's easy to say, you know, I sit somebody down and motion palpate their TL junction, it's stiff. And then we see these other two things, but like, well, what's the offset? And this is the, the question after the question. If we improve TL junction extension, both passive and active, do these other components, the, the T-spine, uh, you know, kind of scalloping, the L5 or S1 lower lumbar extension compensation, do those get better? Possibly. There's other things to work on, like anterior abdominal wall, letting the upper rectus take a break, establishing intra-abdominal pressure, because what else lives at that TL junction area? Your diaphragm. So this is just a huge transitional crucial area to get functioning well. And that is my breakdown of TL junction flexion syndrome.